This whole thing came about because a friend of mine who was working at Fox asked me one day, are you interested in science fiction? Um, and I said, sort of, a specific kind of science fiction I'm interested in, but I'm very particular. Once we had acquired the novel, we had literally just sort of sat down and said, okay, now what do we want to do with this? You know, should I write it? Should we hire a writer? You know, how are we going to approach breaking this down? And we got a call that, that Stephen had always wanted to do this, this film. And it was uh, like a right. godsend. That's good? Yeah, we got to let it draw it It came via the studio that Stephen, having read, I guess, or heard that we had acquired the project, just wanted to make it. He was absolutely passionate about the material and wanted to meet with us to see if we had kind of a, a common vision for it. What do I see here? Well, just this. Just this, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What I'm thinking is, if you do this and you turn, and through, you know, from there you can see the things, but what I'm gonna do, I think, is, is play your reaction, not show what you're reacting to, and then cut in there, what I might do is pull the rear wall out and get our crane going so that I can bring him in, you know, and then drop down, and that's how you see the, the bodies instead of, I don't want to do it in a cut. Yeah, Stephen came to us and uh, we, we had a meeting and while we talked about the project, and Stephen had a very different visual tableau for the movie than we had ever envisioned developing the movie. He had the same themes throughout, and I think movies are ultimately about themes. I actually lobbied for this job. Um, I sent him a letter to him. He was uh, talking to another actor. We just finished doing Ocean's Eleven, and he just finished the script. And I, I read it because it was over at the company, and I read it, and I called him, sent him a letter and said, I don't know if I can do it, but I'd like to take a crack at it. Became a situation, basically, where he said, I'm ready to do this. I mean, I'm as an actor, I'm, I'm ready to do it, and I want to do it, and I think it's good for me to do. Um, and once he said that, I said, fantastic, then let's do it. My interest in Solaris was really driven by the, the ideas at the center of the book, uh, which I tried to expand upon as best I could. <laughs> Come be here. Do one of those. Marker. What's really exciting about what Steven does is every single film he does, he tries basically a completely different genre, you know. And this is one that's sort of a mixture of a bunch of them. But the one thing you'll you will see as uh, as you watch the film, you'll take note of is how still it is. So it isn't a lot of great flashy action. If you look up, you know, just before uh, I pass you, that would be. I'm so excited about the element of surprise when I see it, because I know I'm going to be surprised whatever Stephen does, because the whole process of making it has been, you know, quite mysterious, and, and uh, Stephen has it all in his mind, and, and, you know, one isn't necessarily privy to that. And I, and, and I love that, because it's quite freeing in a way. Hey. no simple shot. Every shot in it had some element that kept it from being easy, whether it was a technical element or a performance thing. So it was all, they're just, every, I, every day I thought I'd get to something that 
would go quickly or easily, I was always foiled. I was purposefully trying to keep myself open to exploring it on the spot and not trying to nail stuff down because I didn't want to I didn't want to come in and tell the actors okay you're there and you're there and you say this and then you cross over there and so I was trying to do my homework in terms of writing out or writing down how all these things should should fit together um, but you never know until you put it together Water and water. Please. Water, water. Water, water. 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 The setup is sort of classical in the sense that George Clooney's character, Chris Kelvin, is sent to try and recover what is basically an abandoned space mission because he happens to know one of the people on board and their previous attempts to bring this crew back have failed. He doesn't know what he's walking into. He's shown some tapes of some some transmissions that have been sent down from Solaris and it just looks like these people are, are you know, the wheels are coming off. Hi, Chris. I'm sorry I'm not here to meet you. I still have a little time and I, I want to tell you something. The beauty of Solaris is that, that Solaris is not a planet. It's a, it's a, it's a planet-like object that is an intelligent organism. The moment he enters that station, you know that there is great jeopardy there. Now, you don't understand the nature of the jeopardy right away. You think that there could be anything. There could be a monster. There could be a murderer. It turns out that uh, the jeopardy is, is to one's right, sanity. Right. What? You should have told me. It wouldn't have made any difference. Really? Well, I had to do it, Chris. I had to, you know that. The dilemma you know that, that they're all confronting is that Solaris is generating characters that it's pulling from their subconscious or their past. Daddy. I mean, we're, we're not even sure at times what Solaris has generated in the case of one character we never get to find out. She's a mirror that reflects part of your mind. You provide the formula. She's alive. She is not human. But it's sort of, it, it knows more about yourself than you do. <laughs> to see George literally be a different actor than I've ever seen him. It was really exciting, I mean, it was exciting to watch, to watch him just change. Yeah, it's an, it's an actor's piece. It's, look, you know, um, hardest thing I've ever done by far, and, uh, and scariest uh, as an actor, because you sort of feel way out there on a limb, but, you know, if you're gonna do that, you do that with Steve. If the people that George is interacting with aren't as strong, as he it. is, then you don't have a no. movie. She begged me, Kelvin! Well, then the trick is, because there aren't very many characters, um, finding people who are really distinctive and really strong so that you feel the tension. Natasha McElhone is somebody, actually, that I'd sort of noticed and had my eye on since she did The Merchant Ivory film some years ago. Because it was such a crucial part, I had her come in and read with George. I'll go with you. No, 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 yes, no, no, yes, no, 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 please, no, 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 please don't. It's okay. It's okay. She reminded me of the sort of great European actresses of the 60s and 70s. It was Deborah Zane, our casting director who said one day, I've been thinking about Jeremy Davies. He's so unique, there's just nobody quite yeah, like him. I, <laughs> I wouldn't, uh, no, she won't, she won't talk about it. And the thing is, I'm not even sure if it's a person. Well, I knew for Jabarian that I wanted somebody that wasn't necessarily well known to American audiences. I got this tape from Ulrich. He photographs his dog 
listening to him talk. It's a close-up of his dog with this really odd expression on his face, as Ulrich does one of these monologues. I have come to hate it here. There's only one way out of its reach for us. And something about like the way this guy's mind worked sold me on him. Viola Davis I've worked with twice before. We'll take the findings back to Earth. What if they follow us back? When I decided that I wanted to turn one of the characters in the script from a male to a female, I immediately thought of Viola because she's just so strong. Where to go with the design aspect of the movie was obviously the subject of a lot of discussion between myself and the producers and Phil Messina, the production designer, and Milena Cananero, the costume designer, um, and me, the cameraman. We didn't want to be specific about how far in the future it was. Didn't want it to feel like it was the distant future. We always knew we wanted to take sort of a realistic approach to what the ship would look like as far as the space is being small, sort of showing a lot of the workings of the ship. We actually looked at a lot of stuff from the International Space Station, and that was uh, a lot of good inspiration because in the space station, you, there's a lot of exposed, what we call GAC. There's a lot of stuff clued to the walls. You do see a lot of um, articulation in the structure, in the textures. There's sort of a lot going on with the ship, but it, it has an organization that all hopefully makes a lot of sense. There's nothing you can really go out and buy per se, so everything has to be manufactured. So we have a warehouse where we have a staff shop, we have sculptors, the painters, welding shop. So one piece would take, say like one rib and one of the corridors. First it would be drawn by the art department, then it would go to the sculptors who would sculpt the piece. Then the sculpted piece goes to the mold makers who make a mold of it. And then, because there's not just one piece, there would be like a hundred of each pieces, each one of those. And then it goes to the carpenters, we erect everything. And the first thing we did, we had to open up the stage floor for the core of the spaceship and uh, go down six feet for c concrete footers, put in retaining walls, and then start, that would be the hub. And then after that, we started with the core coming off of it and then laid out for the radial corridor, which is this part down here. And that was said seven weeks ago, we've had about uh, approximately 175 people working on this. Uh, it's been 24 hour days, six days a week. The bottom line is you all want, everybody wants it, you want it to look right, or at least right as you imagine it. The planet itself was uh, intended to be a character in the movie and you know very subtly it needed to change over the course of the entire film starting from a sort of gentle sort of dormant state and then slowly throughout the film progressing into you know a violent fury by the time you get to the end of the film it's sort of chaos i know steven wanted the audience to ask questions about what was happening to the planet um, you know, is it a, a supernatural event or is it some sort of spiritual being? By everybody coming together, uh, we all made something that, that, uh, that, that we were very proud of. When you have a spaceship like ours that has the amount of detail in it, um, a, we had to go to the next step, which is up to 4K resolution. So it's really a lot more data, a lot more, um, a lot more pixels in terms of resolution. It's more resolution than actually the, the film is itself. By the time you composite those in, you really get the bang for your buck in terms of quality. We also worked on a sequence where the Rhea character has committed suicide and she comes back to life in front of everyone's eyes. So there was a creation of a, a wound from drinking some liquid oxygen and it, in a quite graphic uh, detail where this, the flesh was uh, eaten through in her cheek and her neck. Kelvin character carries her back to the bedroom and puts her down on the bed and we get a real close look at her regeneration and she comes back to life. There's a train sequence where 
Kelvin's traveling on a train, and those were all done on a blue screen stage with backgrounds that were shot in Chicago. There's a lot of little things that Stephen enjoys um, just polishing his movie uh, with us. The exterior stuff for the train, that was, uh, that was one of my favorite things in this entire movie. We built a train, we put it on a rig, and we towed it around in the rain. Stephen wanted to have a refrigerated area on the spaceship where you know, bodies would be stored. But what was really interesting for us is as we were adding humidity to the air, we got this really cool looking mist coming out of the, the vents, which Stephen really, really liked. So uh, we decided to shoot like that. Calvin. This is not an action film. People need to know that going in. But that's not, that's not a fault. It's a very positive thing, because this is not a film that is like any other film that you can go and see in a theater. Not this year, not in the last 10 years, and probably not for the next 10 years. This is the different movie. This is science fiction the way science fiction used to be back in the 50s and, and the 60s especially, where it, it's a fiction of ideas, and it's a fiction of people. It's not about, it's not about robots and lasers and all the things. I'm not really interested in making a film about technology, what technology is going to be like a few decades from now. What appealed to me about this story was that it wasn't about that at all. I mean, it was, it is a love story. <laughs> it's the most ambitious movie I've attempted conceptually. Good. All right. Steven, that's a wrap. Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody.